I changed the name of this two or three times, and then finally last night I decided it's going to be called It's a Big Deal. I don't know. You can change it to whatever you want if you write it down. <clears throat> We're looking at the woman that anointed Jesus' head or feet, depending on which, which of the Gospels that you read. But in Matthew 16, so Matthew 26, chap chapter 26, verses 6 to 13. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had leprosy. During supper, a woman came in with a beautiful jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were in indignant when they saw this. What a waste of money, they said. She could have sold it for a fortune and given the money to the poor. But Jesus replied, why berate her for doing such a good thing for me? You will always have the poor among you, but I will not be here with you much longer. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare me for my prepare my body for burial. I assure you, whenever sorry, I assure you, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be talked about in her memory. Who was this lady? If you go to John, you can see in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 10, six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man who raised, who Jesus raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping it with her, her, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with this fragrance. This is Mary and Martha's house. This is Lazarus' place. Jesus has risen Lazarus from the dead here. We see Jesus has gone back to their place a few times in the town of Bethany. This is the woman who sat at Jesus' feet while Martha was making dinner and getting all the stuff ready. And Martha went and complained to Jesus and said, make Mary help me. And Jesus said, well, she's figured out the more important thing. We can see that between Mary and Martha, that Mary's relationship with Jesus was on a deeper level. This is the Mary. Her brother was raised from the dead. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, I thought it was quite interesting because as soon as the two women found out that Jesus was approaching, it was Martha that actually ran out and met Jesus. Mary stayed in the house. So you think, okay, well, Martha, Mary's the one that was deeper with Jesus, but Martha's the one that sprinted out to Jesus, caught Jesus, had the conversation about, and Jesus says, um, that he'll live again. Well, yes, in the resurrection, he goes, no, no, he'll live again now. They get to the grave, and then Mary joins them. This is who this lady was. Why did she bring this thing to, Mary, to Jesus? Why did she bring this jar that was expensive? They say this thing was worth a year's wage, just 300 denarii, a year's wages. This would have been this woman's retirement fund. This would have been her future, sitting in this jar. We don't know where she got it from. We don't know why she had it. But it was a year's worth of resources. Whether she dumped it on his head, whether she dumped it on her feet, or whether Jesus was anointed two different times. A lot of people believe that it is the same event. And if it was the same event, then one of the references refers to her as being a sinful woman. So did she live a life prior to this? Had she been forgiven a lot? Any way we look at it is Jesus was anointed with a year's wages on his feet or on his head or both. A typical jar it was sealed with a wax seal. Oops. It was sealed with a wax seal. It had then linen put over top of it, which I thought was quite interesting. That's what one there and there's one there. There was a wax seal with linen put over top of it with twine put around it, and then the wax was then mixed into the twine so that it wouldn't accidentally be 
the seal would be broken. And then what they would do is when they wanted to open it, it's not just you and I like with a mason jar or a jar of pickles, and you pop the thing open. This was a open at once, and it's open. Use this thing up. And they would rip open the, the, rip open the, the, the linen cover, dig out the wax, and then you would get yourself to the perfume, the nard. The jar would have been made from this stone that was really, really soft. It was a combination. It was, it was a combination between gypsum and calcite. Gypsum, you can actually scrape it with your fingernail. When you think of, when you think of plaster, there's a lot of gypsum in that. Then you have calcite where you can carve it with a knife, but it's a little bit stronger. And this is the material that this thing was made out of. Some people call it an ossuary, not ossuary, call it an um, alabaster box. But there's no, actual, there's no actual documentation that this would have been a box. They all say that it would be like a little urn. And it would have been a very soft, soft rock that this thing was made out of. It was carved. And it was, the, the perfume was made from the spinknard plant. The perfume came from the roots of this plant. You got it actually from the Himalayan mountains. The Himalayan mountains, I believe, is where the Mount, Mount um, or the tallest mountain in the world, the um, Mount Everest is in the Himalayans, I believe. This is where it is, and it borders between, between China and India and Nepal. And it's the only place you can find this, this plant. And they got the perfume from the roots of this thing. And they say that the jar would have come from one of those three locations. But it would have come from the Himalayan mountains. And it would have been imported all the way to Israel. And this woman would have had this jar. And again, as I said, it was an entire year's wages. It would have been such, such a special thing to be hanging on to. And it was used for two purposes. When, they, when a new king was being anointed, they would use the spinknard oil. And they would anoint a king to become the king of Israel, the king of the land that they're in. Or a doctor would use it for very specific reasons for healing. So Mary comes to Jesus looking at her Savior and she opened this jar that was only used for one of two purposes, for healing or to anoint a king. And we look at our king of kings as he was being anointed in this location. We realize that Jesus is, that Mary is, is looking at Jesus and saying, you are in fact the greatest king of all and I will anoint you with the greatest and most expensive perfume that can be given to you. And then she's looking at him, the guy that raised her brother from the dead. And said, for, no, for healing, this is used by doctors. And you healed my brother from the dead. You are the greatest physician of all existence and time. And she gave him this anointing oil, this, this oil that was used for these two purposes. She saw him as the greatest king of all time and the greatest physician of all time. And she anointed him only six days before he was sent to the cross. And this stuff was pungent. It was strong. It says that it, it filled the entire place with the smell. I am sure people walking past the house would have smelled this outside. It was so strong. When Jesus was arrested, this smell would still have been exuding from him because it would have soaked into his skin. As Jesus is being whipped and taken to the cross, the smell would have still been exuding from him because it was strong stuff. She was showing us something here. She was showing us something of, of what this meant to her and what Jesus meant to her. Why was she willing to do this? She had figured out the greatest commandment of all time. Jesus told them when he was asked, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus responded with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the, 
and all the demands of the prophets are based in these two commandments. She is acting out the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It wasn't about the financial cost for this woman. This, this, this gift that she was giving Jesus wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the year's wages. It wasn't about the, even really about the perfume. She'd figured something out that the rich young ruler had not figured out. She figured out something that the tax collector had figured out, but the Pharisees didn't understand. She had figured out what Simeon, who lived in the temple, knew, but the temple leaders hadn't figured out. She would figured out that this is the king of kings. She would figured out the difference between religion and relationship. She would figured out the difference that of, of external relationship and internal. I took this picture on quite a number of years ago. And when you look at this, you're looking at probably the boat in the background. But the boat in the background isn't really what we're looking at. We're looking at the dark spots in the water. That's actually what I was taking a picture of. Just so happens that was the boat that we were on. But just so happens the dark spots in the water are actually the more important and interesting part of this entire picture. And see, the thing about these dark spots in the water, it doesn't even matter how high you get to look down on them or even how close you get and you look at it, you don't know really what those spots are. They could be clouds shining over onto the water or it could be something that's under that water. But it's a coral reef, which I have the picture of. I already wrote that on there. There's a coral reef sitting right there just randomly that was uh, Bermuda, just randomly sitting there. This isn't even one that you went and swam at. This was one we saw when we were on a water taxi. There's a coral reef sitting right there that nobody really enjoyed. Religion is seeing something from the surface without quite really diving in to know really what there's access to. But relationship is realizing that there's so much greater right there, but we won't really be able to experience it until we jump off the boat and dive right in. This was actually in Bahamas, sorry, but I always think it's so interesting. I, I, I love snorkeling. That's Melissa and Danny in the top right. I love snorkeling. I, I love being able to get down below the surface. And when you start seeing what's there, you realize there's so much that God has placed on this earth that we don't even really get to comprehend. It's only been in the last hundred and something years that you've been able to put a mask on your face and be able to clearly see what's underneath the water. For hundreds of years, you've had coral reefs and incredible fish. And a fish shows its colors so much better underwater than it does out of the water. Unless you jump right in, unless you get right up close, this is hiding under the surface. The difference between religion and relationship is religion, you know there's something there that's incredible, but you stay back at a distance. But the relationship, you're jumping right in, you're getting right consumed by the moment. The only way you're really going to see this and really be able to enjoy it is when you get right in. And you're completely surrounded by the water. And you're completely immersed in the situation. And you're experiencing right from the tips of your toes to the top of your head. Relationship is getting right in there. Mary knew the only way to totally be able to move to that higher relationship was to give to Jesus all that she had. Most people, most scholars say this had nothing to do with the money. And most scholars believe that this was an idol that this woman had. She always knew having that jar 
was her idol. She always knew that she could, she could rely on that. Rely on, trust in, keep that off to the side. That was always there. As long as that was there, everything would be okay. And that was her focus. That was her, her intention. That was her thought, was that, that, that jar. And she always knew. She always knew. Regardless of everything that she went through. And if she is the same woman that we read about in the first passage. If she was, she was a woman of ill repute. She was a woman that, was, that had been a prostitute for a while. And she had been forgiven so much. And if that was the case, then she had this thing throughout that entire time. Knowing that that's something she can fall back on. That it, that could get her out of that lifestyle. She always knew that that was there, that was there, that was there. And finally, finally, Jesus shows up at her house. He's having dinner that her sister had made. Having dinner. And she's sitting there and all of a sudden the Lord, not Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, works in her heart and convicts her and says, that jar is more important to you than the Savior who's standing before you. Sure, she could have sold it. Sure, she could have gone and, and, and gotten, even if she'd gotten a half a year's wages out of this thing and given it to the poor. The thing would have mean, meant that that jar was still somewhere. That perfume was still somewhere. Somebody still had it. But if she opened it and she gave it to Jesus and she poured it on his feet, then it was, it was done. And Jesus was the only one that would be able to enjoy it. Only one that was able to, to, to take it. The only one that was able to, to have it. And she wanted him to have it. She wanted to take that idol, take her, take her, her, her thing that she relied on and give it to Jesus and say, I'm going to rely on you. Would I be able to do that? Do you realize that Jesus never asked her to do it? He didn't look at her and say, hey Mary, I know you got that jar. I, I, I am the king. You know Mary, I, I'm going to be put to death in a couple of days from now. Mary, why don't you go ahead and get that? It was completely the conviction and the, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit inside her that drove her to that point. Would I be willing to do that if the Holy Spirit started working in my life and working in my heart and saying, Bob, go and do this? Would I completely trust him? Would I be like Abraham? God actually did ask him through the prompting and the Holy Spirit in his heart and said, Abraham, you remember that kid that we spent all this time getting? Not that God was working too hard at it. He's like, okay, it's time. He knew when it was going to happen. But Abraham was certainly trying. He wouldn't have had Ishmael in the process. But the day came that the baby was born. And then a decade or more longer, then God says, do you remember this kid, your son, your only son, the one that I recognize as being your son, not the one that's going to be fighting for generations with the other one? Do you remember... Isaac, I want you to give him to me. You got another sacrifice here that, that all of a sudden, all of a sudden he wouldn't be able to be good of anything after this. And God stopped Abraham just before it happened. Because it wasn't even about the sacrifice. It wasn't even about the value. It was about the relationship. How much do you trust me? It wasn't about the, the, the alabaster jar. It wasn't about the, the perfume inside it. It wasn't about the sacrifice. It was about are you willing? Am I willing? God asked Abraham, do you love me? God asked the rich young ruler, do you love me? God asked Peter on that beach, do you love me? God asked Mary here, do you love me? The word religion, I've said this so many times over the years, can't stand the word religion. 
I even hear pastors using the term religion. When somebody says they found religion, I often think of finding religion as, as this cold institution that you found. You haven't found religion, you found Jesus. Finding religion is like, to me, like going and finding some stray dog. Finding religion is like finding some nice coffee shop somewhere. But finding Jesus, you have found the loving Savior who truly cares about every detail in your life. I haven't found religion. I haven't found a, an obligation. I haven't found something that, that's just a surface situation that, that, that's sitting out there. I found something that's impacting my heart and changing my life. Mary didn't give this gift because she saw it as an obligation and she had to do it and she reluctantly did it. She saw it as an opportunity to be able to put Jesus first in her life. And move Jesus and move this 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 thing behind her. The rich young ruler, he saw an obligation. He stood there and he looked at his Savior standing right before him. And it's not even like Jesus just happened to approach him in a crowd. This rich young ruler approached Jesus, sought him out, went to the effort of going up to him, finding him, asking him, I've done all this. What else do I need to do? And the, Jesus looked at him and said, Do you know, rich young ruler, little dude? There's something more important in your life than me. There's something more important in your life than, than having a relationship with me. And you'll never be able to have the relationship with me as long as you've got that jar sitting on the shelf. As long as you've got that, that dependence in something else. And he stood there and he looked at his stuff and he looked at Jesus and Jesus says, as long as this stuff is more important, I will never be important to you. And he looked at his stuff and he looked at Jesus and said, I think you're right. And he walked away. And see, this is one of those situations in scripture that I struggle with the most. Would I have chased him? Would I have tried to talk him into it? Would I have tried to say, well, okay, this is like the Abraham situation. You don't, you probably won't have to give it all. You're probably not going to have to. It's going to be at the last minute, all of a sudden, the ram will come out of the bushes. Would I try to talk them through it? Try to convince them to do it? Would I, would I have chased them down? Would I let somebody walk away? I remember um, I had to deal with something. And I had to approach somebody in love about a situation going on in their life. And I had to talk to them. And I lost sleep over it. I struggled so much with it. I was just so distraught over the whole situation. I didn't know what to do. Actually, I knew exactly what to do. I didn't know if I could do it. And it was just breaking me, tearing me apart. And I remember I was working on firewood. I was actually at Pastor Parker's place when we had the firewood over at his place. And I was there cutting firewood and I was praying and I was, and I was, I was just like, God, how am I supposed to do this? And finally... The Lord, just as clearly as anything, said to me, well, if they walk away from me, they're not walking. They're walking away from me, not you. Because I kept saying, would God really want this person to walk away from you if I approach them on this? And the Lord said, well, even if they do, I let the rich young ruler walk away. Because I kept thinking that God wouldn't want them just to walk away. And he said, well, actually... I let the rich young ruler walk away. I do draw a line in the sand sometimes. And that just blew my mind that day. And they weren't all too pleased 
when I talked to them. A couple years later, they thanked me. I cried more in that conversation than they did. But this guy saw his stuff. And sometimes, sometimes people put their stuff. They put their, their needs. They put their, 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 their idol ahead of God. And they're willing to do that. And they are willing to walk away. It's not that Jesus is saying, go away. It's them saying, no, this is more important. Jesus never asked Mary to do this. He didn't even hint at it. It was entirely the Holy Spirit working in her life. She didn't do it for the fame, which was quite interesting because if you look at the end of the verse, verse 13, the end of the chapter, it actually says, Jesus says that as long as scriptures remain, as long as the gospel is preached, this woman will be reminded about. People will know about her and what she did. She wasn't doing it for the fame. But Jesus is like, for eternity. We're going to be in eternity from now in glory. And the word of God is going to be there. And this lady will still remember about her. And we're going to get to meet her. We're going to get to find out, oh, you're the one that anointed his feet. And she won't be remembered as the prostitute. She won't be remembered as the person that she was, but she'll be remembered as the person who did this for Jesus. She'll be remembered as the one that, that gave it all to Jesus, jumped out of the boat, and we always think of jumping out of the boat, you're supposed to stay on the surface of the water. She was going in to get under, completely immersed right in, over her head, to go deeper with Jesus. She was given flack over it. She didn't do it to be centered out, but she was. She wanted to show honor and praise towards her Lord and Savior. And two things happened when she did this. Mary was set free. She had this peace and this this, she, she'd lost, she'd lost, she'd given up, she'd, she'd sacrificed a year's wages to this guy that was in her living room. And she was set free. She no longer looked at that as being her idol and being the most important thing to her. But the second thing that happened was the, the, the 12 inner guys the disciples, the apostles, the movers and shakers, the ones that were supposed to be, the, supposed to be the, the ones that were the example to society, the ones that upon this rock I'm going to build my church, which was Peter, but upon this group that was going to shake the world, the ones that were sent out in groups of two to be able to preach the gospel, raise, they, they were praying for, the, praying for the sick, praying for the dead, they were praying for demons to be cast out, they freaked out. I say Judas, but when you actually look at it, it says that all the disciples were ticked off. We're not talking about week number two of Jesus' ministry. We're talking about T minus six days from Jesus going to the cross. They'd already seen Jesus raise the dead and heal the sick and, and walk on the water and transfiguration and all of that. Jesus has just cleared the temple. He's over at Lazarus' place. That One of the guys that he raised from the dead was having dinner with them. And they got upset. Judas probably drove that attitude in the group. But they didn't see the gain that this woman was having in her heart. They saw how that amount of finances would be able to do this amount of stuff. And see, talking about this, my first thought was, I hope nobody's going to think that I'm wanting somebody to give a year's wages to this church. That's not what this is about at all. 
Because when, when Jesus asked her to do that, nobody got use of it. This isn't about this place. It's about our hearts. So really, if you did, you need to give it somewhere where nobody would even know you did it. Where you'd be gone. It's not about here. It's about our hearts. It's about giving to God. There's those in charge of the budgeters thinking, what? It's not about Bethel. It's about our relationship with Jesus. If our entire relationship with Jesus is simply a religion or an obligation, we've missed the point. Looking from the outside, you can get binoculars. Anybody ever been to a coral reef in a boat? You can be sitting in the boat and looking down and you don't know what's there. You can be sitting, you can, you can go in a helicopter and look straight down at it. You can't see it. One minor detail I'm leaving out, you can go in a glass bottom boat. You do kind of get a good view from it that way. So you may not get wet, but you still need to get under the surface. But the best way to experience it is when you're right in there breaking the rules. Your mask fills with water and you've got a little bit of water in your, in your snorkel and you've got to stand on the coral reef to drain out your mask and your snorkel and then you get back up off your feet and keep going. The only way to really enjoy it is when you... You scraped up your leg, didn't you? Susan accidentally, she depth perception is usually a little bit off and she accidentally kicked the coral reef and it tore up her leg and all of that. You gotta get right in there. Let it impact your life. You enjoy it. You remember things like that. And the Holy Spirit prompts us. Do we really want to do it? If we struggle with it, we need to ask ourselves, why? Why am I struggling with this? We need to look at our hearts. We need to examine. Is there something in there that's holding us back? Is there something that's making us see our relationship with Jesus as just being something that's religion? Is Jesus more than just a face in a painting? Is Jesus a friend that you know? Am I willing to give to Jesus that which is most important to me so that I can have more of him? This was a big deal. It was a big deal that she gave this to Jesus. It was a big deal that she, that she sacrificed for him. It was a big deal that she went and got that jar, opened the jar, which would have been just a matter of just taking the lid off a can of pickles. But this is taking the twine off and digging out that, 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 um, that wax. And as soon as that thing psss, opened up, Everybody in the room knew she'd done it. It was a big deal. Am I willing? Am I willing to do that for my Lord? Am I willing to sacrifice that much? <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for all that you are. I thank you, God, for all that you're doing. I thank you, God, for your awesomeness and your amazingness and your truth and your glory, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray, Jesus, that I will just put you first, Lord Jesus, and I will put you, I will put you ahead, Lord God. I pray, Jesus, that I will go and take off the shelf that which belongs to you and give it to you, Lord. Oh, dear Jesus. I praise you and thank you, God, for all that you are. I thank you, God, for your majesty. I thank you, God, that you love us so much. Oh, Heavenly Father, to you be all glory and honor and praise. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Heavenly Father, we give it to you, Jesus. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, may you transform us and make us like you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be high and lifted up to you. Be all glory, Lord God. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there's something that I've made an idol in my life, Lord God, help me to be able to give it to you, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will go jump out of the boat and completely submerge ourselves in you, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the glory, Lord, the honor and the praise. We lift you, Jesus, up on high. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.